All righty, everybody. Welcome, welcome to the Morrison Planetarium. I just got the okay to start our planetarium show, so I'm going to put away our space trivia questions because now we're going to be heading into the unknown. Ooh. And uh, once again, uh, welcome to the Morrison Planetarium, everybody. Uh, really quickly, I just want to introduce myself. My name is Christian. I'm going to be your planetarium presenter. And just a heads up, I'm not a voice coming out of the walls. I'm actually a person, and I'm standing uh, right behind you up at the pilot's booth. Um, I just want to let you know that I'm here. I want to be your pilot. But uh, don't hurt your neck. Look forward into the dome before you. That's where the whole show is going to be. So, uh, again, just want to let you know that I'm here. And uh, what do you call it? Kind of curious. Um if y'all could do me a favor, how many of y'all have been to a planetarium before? Raise your hand if you've been to one before. All right, a few folks. Ooh, more folks. Excellent. Faith and humanity restored. How many of y'all have never been to a planetarium? It's your first one. All righty, a few newcomers. Welcome, welcome, everybody. Hopefully by the end of this planetarium show, you'll love them just as much as I do. I love it in here. Everything that you see in purple is going to be one enormous screen. Thanks to the help of six different projectors hiding throughout our planetarium dome. Uh, they're kind of hiding just below that purple glow. And uh, just to let you know, folks, uh, the show that we're going to be doing right now is one of my personal favorites to do. It is so fun. Uh, the show that we're going to be doing, it's called Tour of the Universe. And essentially what that means, we're going to be starting off pretty close to planet Earth. And we're going to be zooming all the way out to the very edge of the known universe. And along the way, we'll be checking out some really cool things. And hopefully by the end of the show, you will have an existential crisis of where we are in space because we are very tiny. Hee hee hee. And uh, before we get started, folks, I do got to go over some quick house rules just so that we're all on the same page. We're going to have a great experience in the planetarium. There's quite a few of us in here. Uh, first off, there's no food or drinks allowed inside. If you manage to bring any, please make sure those are tucked away till the very end of the show. We want to make sure this theater stays nice and clean for all of our guests coming in today and in the future. And uh, this also does include no feetsies on the seatsies because, again, we want to make sure this theater stays clean. So thank you for that. Also, folks, if you happen to have any 21st century gadgets like cell phones, smartwatches, tablets, anything that produces bright white light, now is the perfect time to turn them off, deactivate them, put them away for the next 30 minutes. Again, these produce bright white light, bright white light that can be very distracting, not only for yourself, but for the folks sitting behind you. So again, we appreciate your help. And also, folks, the biggest in the mall, please, please, please wear your mask above your nose at all times throughout this presentation. We're going to be in here for 30 minutes, and there's about 35, 40 of us here. So again, please wear your mask. Can't stress that enough. Thank you so much. And also, folks, if you need to exit the planetarium for any reason, you're more than welcome to do so. All we ask is that you exit at the very top of the planetarium. That's where the exits are going to be before, during, and after the show. So when in doubt, always make your way up the stairs, not down them. And last but not least, folks, this show can be very immersive thanks to our 70-foot uh, dome above us. If at any point during the show you start to feel overwhelmed, you start to experience motion sensitivity, uh, that's common. But there's also a really quick and easy way to ground yourself. All you got to do is close your eyes, take a few big deep breaths. Your brain will remember that you're sitting in a planetarium in San Francisco and not hurtling through space, at least not more than the usual. Hee hee hee. But otherwise, uh, that's all I have to say. Y'all ready for a cool planetarium show? I'm a, yeah, all righty, I'll take that as a yes. So let's get started, everyone. So let's sit back, relax, and here it comes, Tour of the Universe. All righty, folks, as I mentioned, we're going to be starting off pretty close to planet Earth at this really cool thing called the International Space Station. We're on the backside of it right now, and we can also call this the ISS for short, but the International Space Station is by far one of my favorite things humans have ever done. Pretty much this is the biggest thing we put into orbit around planet Earth, and the International Space Station is a research facility, again, that's orbiting around our planet, and this is thanks to uh, many nations collaborating to pretty much figure out what happens to things in space. Now, this was first started by Russia in 1998, and uh, it was first uh, began with a module right in the middle. Since then, many nations have added, added different modules to it, so it's been getting bigger over the years. And the type of sciences or uh, studies that they conduct here are all sorts of them. Uh, for example, they want to figure out how exactly do plants grow out here in space? Do they grow the same way uh, as they do on Earth, where they're much more closer to gravity? Or do they grow differently? 
Um, is gravity a very big factor, part of a plant's growth? Uh, what happens when you try to turn on a flame out here in space? Does it behave the same way? So these are just a couple of different things that they've done out here at the International Space Station. And folks, the International Space Station is incredibly large. Um, it's about the size of an American football field, so uh, as big as the, uh, the California Academy of Sciences, this whole museum, just to give you an idea of how large it is. And not only that, folks, this thing is going incredibly fast. It's going to whop in 17,000 miles per hour, where it orbits once around the Earth every 90 minutes, where it experiences 16 sunrises and 16 sunsets a day. Whew, how romantic. <laughs> And uh, folks, it's not too far away from our planet, although it looks really far above. It's only about 225 miles above the surface of Earth. So 225 miles, that's like going from San Francisco to Santa Barbara, a nice little road trip to get away with the family for the weekend. So it's not too bad. And folks, the International Space Station is as far as we put humans into space nowadays because traveling into space gets quite costly quite rapidly. First, you got to account for, or first, you got to get your hands on a rocket ship or build yourself a rocket ship, and that's quite costly on its own. And then, not only that, you have to account for all the rocket fuel to get to your rocket ship, crewmates, and everybody off, off the planet. So, that's going to be a whole lot. And then, not only that, you're going to have to account for all the food, water, and all the air you're going to be breathing while you're out here in space. So, the bill starts to add up quite quickly, quite rapidly. But let's leave the International Space Station. We're going to start to slowly see it disappear compared to our planet. It looks like we're hovering just above Australia right now, so we're going to see it disappear. And before it leaves our view, I'm going to have a nice orbital path so we can keep track of the International Space Station as we start to zoom away from it. And also, folks, um, just to let you know, the space program that we're using right now is something that you can go home and download, and you're able to fly through space as well. The program that I'm using is called Open Space. Uh, this is an open source program, which means is that uh, anybody can uh, help and uh, help with this project. And uh, not only that, you can also download it at home. But just to let you know, uh, this program is in its beta phase, phase, which means it's not completely done. We may encounter a few glitches here and there. If we do, I'll let you know about them. But for the most part, it runs incredibly smoothly. And uh, if you do want to go home and download it, uh, just go to your favorite search engine and type in Open Space Project, and you'll come across it. Just a warning, folks, uh, this program does take a whole lot of memory and a lot of processing power. So if you have an older computer, you may want to rethink it. Unless you have a newer uh, computer or a gaming computer, then go ahead, give Open Space a try. But really fun program to fly through in space. But let's leave the Earth, folks, and let's make our way over to our nearest natural neighbor to us in space, the moon. All righty, folks, so we're making our way to our nearest natural neighbor, the moon, and it looks like uh, we have a nice crescent moon, so we're not seeing a whole lot of it, but luckily we are inside of a planetarium, so I've got some special abilities here, so I want to turn off the nighttime. And there we go, that looks much more familiar. And just to let you know, folks, we humans have been to the moon before, but that was quite a while ago. That was between 1969 and 1972, thanks to NASA's six Apollo space missions that brought a total of 12 incredibly lucky guys to walk on the surface of the moon, uh, play golf, and of course, they got to conduct science experiments up here as well. But again, that was quite a while ago, a little more than 50 years ago or so. But don't worry, folks, NASA has a new space mission in the works. Uh, that should be launching in the next year or two. Hopefully, everything goes according to plan. And this new space mission is called Artemis. Now, Artemis is the sister to Apollo, which <laughs> Apollo missions, Artemis missions, uh, quite funny. But not only that, um, with this whole new space program, they're going to be sending the first woman to the moon. But not only that, they're also going to be sending the first person of color to the moon. But not only that, there's more folks. Uh, they're also going to be setting up the first lunar bases here on the moon. Pretty much the whole goal of Artemis is to send humans to Mars. But before we send humans all the way deep into our solar system, uh, much further away than the moon, uh, we want to figure out how exactly we humans are going to survive out here on a celestial body. So again, instead of sending humans all the way to Mars and trying to have them figure it out on their own, um, the moon is much, much closer to home, a nice stepping stone to pretty much get started with that uh, mission. And what's also really amazing about Artemis is that they're going to have a uh, many moon bases uh, around the moon, so there's going to be uh, multiple of them. And they're also going to have uh, 
a lunar gateway, which is similar to the International Space Station that we saw. So it's going to be orbiting around the moon. So if anything was to go wrong, uh, these astronauts can launch off the moon and then head to lunar gateway, that space station orbiting around, so where they can be safe. So really cool things in the work coming in the next year or two. So look out for any news about Artemis. Um, again, hopefully everything goes according to plan. And folks, here on Earth, when we look up at the moon, it feels incredibly close to us. Sometimes it feels like you can reach up and uh, touch the moon with your hand. But the moon is incredibly far away from us. It's about 240,000 miles away from the Earth. Whew, 240,000 miles. Some of the adults in this, this room may have a car with that many miles on it. And folks, uh, if you can even imagine driving to the moon, um, you could technically do that if you, of course, had four-wheel drive and a rocket ship. Uh, but it would take you four months going about 80 miles per hour. Although I wouldn't recommend it. The roads out here are poorly maintained. He, he, he. And uh, from here on now, folks, we're going to need to use a more useful measuring stick because at this scale, using miles is kind of like using inches to describe the distances between cities because space is so vast. Instead, astronomers use a more convenient measurement known as light speed. Now, light travels at a mind-boggling speed of 187,000 miles per second. That's roughly about 300,000 kilometers per second. So while it took the astronauts more than three days to reach the moon, traveling faster and farther than any human has done so or since, it only takes light one and a half seconds to cross that distance at the speed of light. That's kind of like a short uh, pause in conversation, so incredibly fast. But let's leave the moon behind, folks, so everybody say bye-bye, moon. We'll see you later. And now, folks, we're going to start to see the moon and the Earth and their orbits as they slowly recede. There they go. So we're going to say goodbye to the moon and our Earth. And now we're going to be stepping into a much greater realm of our solar system. Because on our journey, we're going to be traveling much faster than the speed of light. We're going to be traveling at the speed of the human imagination, thanks to the help of computer models like Open Space, showing us the most accurate images and information available to us. Now the nearest star to us, the sun comes into view, and the sun is incredibly far away from us. It's about 93 million miles away from planet Earth. 93 million miles away? Whew. In terms of speed of light, light speed, uh, that's only about eight and a half minutes. So again, at the speed of light, only eight and a half minutes. Now, this is a really cool uh, concept to keep in mind, folks, because again, we're the third rock from the sun. That's us right over there. So let's say the sun was to turn off all of a sudden. That last bit of sunlight that would be emitted from the sun would travel that 93 million miles or eight and a half minutes, and eventually it would reach us here on Earth. And then all of a sudden, the daytime would turn off. It would be gone, and it would be nighttime. So again, takes it, take it, it, takes it eight and a half minutes to travel that incredibly long distance. Now, this also works for really far away objects as well. For example, let's say we're looking at a star that's 60 light years away from us. Well, we're looking at that star as it looked like 60 years ago because it takes that long for that light to reach us. So when you're looking at really far away objects out here in space, it's kind of like looking back in time in a sense. So pretty cool. But now we have a nice bird's eye view of our solar system. So really quickly, I'm going to name all the objects that we have here. So right in the middle, of course, we have our sun, the star. And then the closest planet to the sun is going to be Mercury. Then we have Venus, Earth, that's us, and then Mars. These are the rocky terrestrial planets. These are places we can actually land a spacecraft on. And then beyond Mars, we have this really cool thing called the asteroid belt. And this is what the asteroid belt would look like if we to highlight all those asteroids. Give open space a second or two. There is a whole lot of asteroids in our asteroid belt. And there they are. Now, what's well, probably one of my favorite facts I've learned not too long ago is that the asteroid belt was discovered uh, by these uh, early astronomers in the 1800s, and their organization was called the Celestial Police. So the Celestial Police came across the asteroid belt. So pretty, pretty funny. Sounds like something you would come across in Doctor Who. And then beyond the asteroid belt, we have the really big planets. We have the gas giants, the Jovians. We've got Jupiter and, of course, Saturn. And then beyond those, we have the icy giants. We've got Uranus, the funny one, and Neptune. And of course, of course, I can always add uh, everyone's favorite and lovable dwarf planet, Pluto. A lot of people tend to ask me, hey, Christian, why did Pluto get kicked out of the planet club? I love Pluto. I learned about it in school. Viva la Pluto. Well, you see, folks, Pluto hangs out here in this outer part of our solar system called the Kuiper Belt. 
And you're probably wondering to yourself, what's the Kuiper Belt? I've never heard of that before. Well, the Kuiper Belt's going to be all this stuff. There it is. So the Kuiper Belt's essentially a second asteroid belt, belt uh, mostly icy asteroids and icy comets that hang out here. And uh, in 2006, we found more than 400 ob objects out here, so we couldn't call all this stuff planets. There was just way too many of them. So all the astronomers across planet Earth came together, had a great big meeting. They had to figure out what exactly you need, need to be to consider the planet. And one of the criteria is that you need to be so big and so massive that you push all the other stuff out of your orbital path. Unfortunately for Pluto, it did not pass that criteria criteria, which is why it's now considered a dwarf planet. But don't worry, uh, Pluto's got a few dwarf planets out here in the Kuiper Belt region. We've got Maki, Maki, Eris, and Haumea, just to name a few. And of course, we have Ceres in our main asteroid belts. But I want to put away the Kuiper Belt, because that's a whole lot to look at. And then now I'm going to be adding up some space uh, explorers that we sent out in the 1970s to explore our solar system. And here they are. So uh, right now on screen, we have Pioneer 10, Pioneer 11, Voyager 1, and Voyager 2. And the latest of them all, uh, we have New Horizons, which did a nice quick flyby of Pluto in 2015. We could see a nice interaction on the bottom right over here. Thanks to that quick flyby, we were able to get some amazing images of the dwarf planet Pluto. In the past, our photos were pretty much pixelated blue dots. So uh, pretty much New Horizons continued its path, didn't orbit, and is continuing to leave the solar system. Now, folks, to give you an idea how long it takes for light to travel all the way from uh, the sun to the orbit of Pluto, it's going to take about five light hours. So we went from eight minutes to five light hours to get out here to the outer part of our solar system. But let's leave our solar system and planetary scale far behind us now, because now we're going to be entering into interstellar space, the space between the stars. Distance now becomes so immense uh, it's going to take us over four years at the speed of light just to reach the next star system to us, the Alpha Centauri system. And if my calculations are correct, Alpha Centauri is going to be this top left uh, star closest to us. So four years at the speed of light just to get here. Now, to give you an idea how long it would take to get in a rocket ship and travel all the way to the next star system in our current rocket uh, capabilities, it's going to take about 8,000 years. Whew, that is a very, very long road trip. But let's stop and consider whether humanity has made its presence known beyond our solar system, because folks, now we are stepping inside something called the radio sphere. So again, we are now inside the radio sphere, and this represents the current limits of the most distant radio, radio signals humanity has ever broadcasted, or rather leaked into space. And it extends about 90 light years in all directions emitting out from the Earth. Now, this first began in the early 1930s with strong radio waves, early television, and radar signal, and then later, the detonation of atomic weapons. All these things are emitting electromagnetic radiation strong enough to escape the Earth's ionosphere. Now, humans were broadcasting well before that, but the earliest radio was not quite powerful enough to escape the Earth. And since all these signals are electromagnetic, they travel at the speed of light, so this is kind of like humanity's electromagnetic footprint in the universe. And of course, folks, the radio sphere is constantly expanding at the rate of one light year per year. So is anybody out there listening? And uh, now, folks, I'm going to be adding um, some markers onto the screen. These markers are going to represent the many thousands of stars astronomers have discovered over the last 22 years, which has at least one or more planets uh, orbiting around them. We call these planets exoplanets, and we're looking for any of them that are Earth-like with conditions suitable for life as we know it. Now, just to let you know, folks, uh, so far to date, we found more than 4,000 exoplanets just in our nearby vicinity, and that number is going to be increasing in the near future because we have new space telescopes like Gaia, which its sole purpose is to find as many exoplanets as possible. So that 4,000 number is going to be increasing as, the, as time continues. Now, to figure out if any of them are uh, Earth-like with conditions suitable for life as we know it, well, our technology is not yet able to answer that question, but new generations of astronomical instruments are devoted for that search. The important point here is that quite a few of these planetary systems are within that 90 light year limit of our radio sphere and could have potentially received our signals. However, since radio waves travel at the speed of light, if there is anybody that's out there able to listen in and answer back, the communication delays between hellos could be decades in time. 
Now, to give you an example, let's say we live on the very far left of one of these radio spheres, uh, these systems. Let's say we live in this one right here, and we find an alien civilization that's 60 light years away from us. Let's say over here, we shoot them a text message, take 60 years to get to them. They listen in, answer back. Another 60 years, that is a 120-year conversation in the making. Whew, and I can barely wait for a text message from my friend. <laughs> But of course, folks, planetary systems beyond our radio sphere, more than 90 light years away, have not heard from us yet, but eventually they will, as the radio sphere is always growing, but, but it becomes weaker as it does. And I want to put away our exoplanet marker, but I want to keep our radio sphere up there because that is a great reference point. As huge as humanity's electromagnetic footprint is, it is nothing compared to our Milky Way galaxy. All righty, can anybody see their house from here? <laughs> so we are now looking down at our Milky Way galaxy, folks. And our Milky Way galaxy is incredibly large. If you wanted to transverse our galaxy from one side to the other, it's going to take you about 130,000 light years to cross this. Whew, that is incredibly large. But not only that, folks, our Milky Way is so huge, we estimate that there's at least 300 billion stars in our galaxy alone. If our recent discovery of so many exoplanets just within our small neighborhood within this vast star city is any indication, there could be billions of planets and potentially millions of Earth-like planets throughout our single galaxy. And before we leave our galaxy, I do want to show you the shape of it. When we look at our galaxy from a sideways perspective, you notice that we live in a flat spiral disk. And here it is. So this is going to come important later on in the show. When scientists and astronomers want to learn about the universe, it's so much more easier for them to point their telescopes and equipment galactically north and galactically south instead of looking through the plane of the Milky Way, which has a gas, nebula, planets, stars, things that obscure their view of the universe. So just keep that in mind. We live in a flat spiral disk, much easier to look galactically north and south. But the Milky Way is only one of many hundreds of billions of galaxies that comprise the known universe. So folks, in this giant leap, we're now going to see a view where each point of light no longer represents a star. It now represents the location of an individual galaxy, each galaxy containing hundreds of billions, perhaps trillions of stars. Now, we live in a local galaxy group, which contains about 30 galaxies, large and small. Also includes the nearest large spiral to us, the Andromeda Galaxy, only 2 million light years away, just next door, and heading right for us. We're going to get to know it pretty intimately in about 5 billion years, so mark your calendars. And folks, as our picture expands, uh, we discover that galaxies are not evenly distributed throughout space. Instead, galaxies like to clump together in large clusters with great regions or voids where there's very few galaxies. So we can see a few nice galaxy clusters to the very top right here, over here, and we can also see some voids just below that where there's very few galaxies or no galaxies. So galaxies like to hang out together or avoid each other, kind of like humans. <laughs> and folks, we've zoomed so far back now that this picture represents the 30,000 closest galaxies to us in space over 300 million light years across. Now, we got to give thanks to an amazing astronomer by the name of Dr. Brent Tolley, who worked at the University of Hawaii that compiled this amazing representation of this uh, galaxy network. And he was also able to do this with the work of dozens of astronomers working aside him uh, for over decades of time. So a big shout out to Dr. Brent Tolley and his team. But now we have automated systems that are mapping even the most distant galaxies. So now, folks, we're about to see the large scale structure of the universe. And remember, folks, every single point of light that you're seeing is not a star. That's an individual galaxy. Ooh. And remember, uh, just a heads up, folks, the universe is not shaped like a bow tie or a butterfly. Uh, the reason why we have this, uh, these dark regions or gaps is because we live in that Milky Way galaxy. Remember, we, I just told you we live in a flat spiral disk? Well, if we were to line up our Milky Way galaxy, it would line up perfectly uh, with these voids. So again, astronomers point their telescopes galactically north and galactically south. But astronomers still wanted to make sure that they were able to find galaxies through the Milky Way plane. And we have a nice purple survey of galaxies right in the middle. You're going to notice that it doesn't go as far out as they would like because, again, all that gas and debris that obscures their view. 
But as our technology uh, progresses, uh, I'm sure these dark gaps will be eventually filled in. It's only a matter of time. But let's continue pressing on, folks, because it looks like we're running close out of time. And now we're going to be pressing uh, much, much further back to an earlier age of our universe, because now we're going to be looking at the quasars. And the quasars are going to be all these orange dots at the very edge of the large scale structure of the universe. So every single orange dot is a quasar. And the quasars are very, very young, very distant galaxies. And it's short for quasi-stellar radio sources. These blazing objects are all billions of light years away. So now we're looking so far back in the depth of time and space that the most distant quasars represent the universe at a much earlier age. We're nearing the very beginning of galaxy formation. In other words, with the quasars, we're viewing a sort of awkward, gawky teenage version of the universe. And before there was a teenager, there was a baby. So let's press back to a time before planets, before stars, and even galaxies began to form. Folks, we are now about to approach the very edge of the known universe. And here we are. So what we're looking at now is something called the Cosmic Microwave Background Image, or the CMB image for short. And all evidence indicates that the universe that we live in is about 13.8 billion years old. And this is data compiled by Planck and other radio telescopes. And the picture that we're looking at is a very baby version of the universe only 380,000 years after the Big Bang occurred, where space and time began. And what we're looking at is not a typical photo either, but a temperature density image where the light echoes of the Big Bang are color coded with lighter areas corresponding to the hottest, least dense regions, and the darker areas, the coolest, densest regions. These fluctuations in temperature and density are extremely, extremely tiny. They vary no more than one part per 100,000. But eventually, they gave rise to a large-scale structure of the universe, that clumping and clustering of galaxies everywhere. Figuring out just how that happened is one of the larger challenges for cosmological research today. Though our view here is of the outer edge of the known universe, the earliest light visible to us, that radiation actually persists all around us. It permeates the universe, stretching and cooling as the universe expands over billions of years of time. But folks, we've traveled as far back as the law of physics can physically allow us, so we only have one direction left to go, which is back home. Now, before we make our return trip back to planet Earth, I've got to ask y'all to prepare yourself, because this could possibly be the worst free-falling dream ever. Hee hee hee. But let's find a nice entry point through all these uh, galaxies and quasars to make our return trip back to planet Earth. And that looks like a good spot. And... Let's return home, folks. All righty, folks. So we are crossing an expanse of 13 billion light years. We present you with this view of our universe and the latest in cosmological and astronomical information. We're covering eons and observing objects billions of light years apart. Now, we live in a golden age of astronomy with new generations of telescopes and spacecrafts that are extending the reaches of our eyes, preparing for the eventual race between the advancement of technology and the accelerating expansion of the universe. With that thought, I want to remind everyone that astronomy is for everyone. You don't need to be a rocket scientist to enjoy the beauties and wonders of our universe. All you need is the night sky, and if you can, get away from the lights of our cities and look up. Even a good pair of binoculars makes for a decent first telescope, and there's astronomy clubs all around the world that invite people just like you to look through their telescopes and peer into the great beyond, allowing you to partake in the wonders that our universe has to offer. Now, astronomy as a hobby can offer an endless supply of satisfaction, and I do hope you'll join us, those who dream amongst the stars. But it looks like we just entered our Milky Way galaxy. We are making our way right into our radio sphere. And of course, we are making our way back town, making our way downtown, walking fast, faces passing, we're homebound. Dun, 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 dun. <laughs> and now it looks like we're approaching our planetary system, passing those space voyagers we sent out in the 1970s, passing the Kuiper Belt and the orbit of Pluto. And we're making our way to the third rock from the sun, our home world, the only place humans have ever called home. And as we make our final approach back to planet Earth, folks, I want to thank you all for stopping by and watching Tour of the Universe with me. I hope you did enjoy it. But it looks like we made it back home safe and sound. And that's all I have for you today, folks. Thank you again.